As many of you probably know, Microsoft in the past several years has gone through a pretty, uh, pretty substantial change in, in their business model and really embracing digital transformation, not just internally, but also helping our customers embrace digital transformation. We, we hear that word or that phrase said a lot. What does it really mean? It, it's sometimes easier to define it by what it's not. It's not just simply taking something that uh, enterprise is already doing and automating it. It's not just taking a paper-based system and making an electronic form and you know just an auto workflow. It's much more substantial than that. It's really looking at your current business models and really reimagining them and taking advantage of what the digital age can provide. If you take a look at Microsoft's business model, you know a few years ago we were still very much a SKU-based company, right? We sold box software, right? Here's your Windows license, here's your uh, CAL or whatever for Exchange and things like that. You know, uh, we're selling you server software to run in your own data center. And that's really not us anymore, right? It's all about, you know, the cloud, it's all about uh, essentially software on demand, platform as a service, uh, huge pushes into AI and machine learning to really give companies a completely new capabilities that they can use to change their business. And I'm going to talk about some of those and frankly how Node really enabled a lot of those changes. Right. You know, when we talk about any technology stack or anything that we do as a technology professional, you always have to think about what you're doing day to day and what, what is the value to the business, right? Are you, are you doing something that ultimately improves these two metrics? Because these are the two KPIs that are the most important ones to any business. If these aren't right, your business is going to fail, right? If you're not making yourself more productive, if you're not making your team more productive, the rest of the company more productive, or even your actual consumers, your actual end users and customers, you should be doing something that makes their life easier makes them find solutions easier to the problems that they solve. You work on a, a technology stack like Node, it helps with that. It is a very productive stack. Uh, I, in, in my career, I've, I've built some back-end systems and everything from uh, C, C++, PHP, mm, you know, <laughs> Java, and, and Node. And you know, the first time I sat down and wrote uh, a, a small back-end system. It was just processing some audio and video in and, and Node. I was shocked by how productive I was and how much more capability I was able to get done uh, compared to any other technology stack at the time. It was very important. And that also leads into the second piece, revenue for a business. V of course, very important. And how Node impacts that is you know, part of the productivity cycle, being able to bring a solution quicker to market that has more features will help grow your revenue. And that's fundamentally, everything that I'm going to talk about after this will drive those two things. So, you know, we always talk about community, but I really had an epiphany uh, several weeks ago. Uh, I was with a group at, at Microsoft. We're working on uh, the next version of the bot framework, if anyone uses uh, the bot framework. And, you know, we, it really starts with the individual. And what I say, but say where it starts there, if the individual is happy using the tool chain, if they enjoy what they do, then that makes them more productive. That makes them create better code, that create a better system. They enjoy their work. Someone was mentioning, you know, the carrot and the stick earlier. Well, that's a pretty big carrot. If you actually enjoy what you do, it, it helps motivate you. How many people here use Node and actually enjoy it? I mean, just raise your hands. It's everyone, right? Um, I'm going to be asking a few more questions too, so, so pay attention. Uh, and uh, in the context of this uh, was very, very surprising. Uh, of course, Microsoft is, is known as a C-sharp uh, uh, place, right? So we're building this next version of the framework, and the Node.js API was the one that was the most complete first by all the, the product teams inside of uh, Microsoft. I was kind of shocked by that. The uh, C Sharp team was actually complaining, uh, these APIs, they kind of feel like JavaScript APIs. Yeah, well, they're, they're simple and they work. You know, and that, th that was a very big eye-opening thing, even internally in Microsoft. You know, Node has really taken uh, uh, first-class 
uh, development platform inside of Microsoft. A lot of the Azure, a lot of the things that you use daily, uh, you don't realize we wrote those in Node and we maintain those in Node. So once you have the individual, that leads to the strong communities. Uh, just taking a look at the, the room that we have here, the people that I've worked with in Node, uh, it's a very uh, diverse community. And when, when I say diverse, by all the different backgrounds and the types of problems that we're trying to solve. Node is being used you know, for building backends, of course. It's used for some front-end development. It's even used uh, uh, for traditional desktop applications with uh, Electron and things like that. Very few other technology stacks can claim that. And the ones that do, they're relatively kind of hard to use when you, you're putting a square peg into a round hole when you try to move them to these other areas. Whereas uh, JavaScript, TypeScript, and Node, it just kind of fits and it works well. And when we look at this room and all the different companies uh, that are here and the people that are here, I see a lot of uh, our customers. There's a lot of people that are partners, a lot of people that are competitors. Yet we're all here, you know, sharing these ideas and learning from each other. So it's a really good, strong community that we have with Node, which again leads back to being able to solve problems faster and helping your businesses grow. And then this, I think, is, is going to be my last, oh, I'm out of frame. Uh, the last key concept here uh, that I think is very important with Node that sometimes gets overlooked. Uh, I'm going to ask a question. How many people uh, in your office, at your desk, have, you know, at one time or another, had a nice big chart on the wall of some system or systems that you were responsible for with a bunch of boxes everywhere? and a lot of lines connecting them. How many people have had that? Not a lot. How many people actually enjoyed working on that system? Not a single hand is up at this point. You know, complexity is easy, right? If you're not planning things well or you inherit some other systems, inevitably you end up with something that's complex. And something complex is, is just not good for business. Uh, when I uh, work with someone, I see their solution, and I say, wow, that's a simple solution. You know, some people might take that as a slight. It's not. That's the best possible compliment I can give you. Your, your solution is simple, it's straightforward, which means it's going to be easy to maintain, it's going to be resilient to change, and it, it's just going to be flexible. And Node, at, at its core, a lot of what it does you know, everything from like the package management system and how you do your de dependencies and stuff like that, it's very simple and it's easy for people to get into the ecosystem and understand it and be able to piece things together. Uh, when we talk about the different design patterns and all these things that we implement, they're very straightforward to implement and know that the language, the system doesn't get in your way of trying to do what you need to do. And by keeping things simple, Again, that speeds up your productivity, lets you get things to market very quickly, and so forth. Now with that, I'm going to be passing over uh, to my colleague Chris here. Come on over. <laughs> um, I, you know, uh, when we talk about people having fun and really enjoying what they do, that's, cr that's Chris and his team. He gets to work on a phenomenal product, and he gets to see it in use every day by millions of people, which is just an awesome thing to have. So with All that. Right. Thank you very much. All right, I'm the last thing that stands between you and lunch, so <laughs> do the best I can. And I have to stand around the podium or else I'll get in trouble by those guys. Uh, so yeah, I work on the Visual Studio Code team amongst other teams, uh, and I, wanted, I thought it'd be fun. We could talk about a transformation, the journey that we went through on Visual Studio Code, and developer tools really, um, and, and talking about that journey, it's all based around Node and Electron and productivity. But I always love to start with a, an interesting tweet. And here we have the Prime Minister of Singapore actually coding with Visual Studio Code, which is awesome. So a little wall of fame up in the team room to see who we can get on the tool. Uh, who here knows what Visual Studio Code is? Okay, that's cool. That <laughs> makes that slide way easier. <laughs> So it's our lightweight cross-platform open source editor. Um, it has some fantastic momentum. It's really only been around for three years since we announced the, uh, the first beta, the first pre-release. Uh, we've got more than three and a half million uh, active monthly users on the tool, which is pretty crazy if you think about it in that amount of time. 7,000 extensions and more in the marketplace. A lot of them are themes and stuff, but there's still 7,000 things. 
Um, and I at the end of the, the calendar years, you, you always get to see these cool end of year surveys, what happened. There's two cool ones that came out for us. Uh, one was the state of JavaScript in 2017, and it showed that uh, by far VS Code was uh, the number one editor for TypeScript, JavaScript type development. And the other one came out a little bit more recently was the Stack Overflow survey, where we beat out our big brother Visual Studio just by a hair, but we beat them anyway. Um, so it's got a great you know, momentum behind, uh, behind the tool, which is fun to see. But it didn't just happen overnight, right? It just didn't pop up, and we you know, had this very popular tool. Um, a few years ago, we kind of said, you know, uh, well, let's start with the story. So we thought about it like this. You know, if you go into Starbucks, and you see all these cool kids with Macs, and they're doing JavaScript and TypeScript, and they've got all sorts of stuff. Microsoft couldn't talk to these people. I couldn't walk in and go, hey, cool kid with the Mac <laughs> doing stuff. I have the best development tool out there. It's called Visual Studio. But in order for you to come over and see it, you got to close the Mac, uh, move over to Windows, and s install some bits. There's a lot of bits in there. And then drop everything and come over to C Sharp in the framework, and you'll have an awesome time. Um, this is just a conversation we couldn't have with people. So what we decide is that you know, we can't operate like that uh, anymore. We really need to go and meet developers where they are. And so this is when we decided to do a cross-platform open source development tool, an editor, and sort of fill out the, the space that uh, really didn't exist for Microsoft. We had the IDE. You, know, you think about the IDE, everything's in there. We didn't have an editor. Like, that's the other thing that really cool kids are doing in Starbucks is they're using Sublime and Atom and, and all these other editors and Vim and Notepad++. There's a whole stream of editors that people use. Um, so what we decided to do was come up with a, a cross-platform open source editor. And, and our goal was really to say, hey, you know what? Let's, let's kind of redefine what a code editor is. We're going to take a couple cool things from an IDE, which are debugging and great IntelliSense experiences, and we'll bring those to the editor space, because those are the sort of the key things that Visual Studio and Microsoft and developer tools really over time have been really well known for. Um, so it's an open source project, but it's not, I mean, open source, we put all our source in GitHub. But I really like to describe it as we do development in the open. And it's a slightly different spin on thing, but it really explains what we do day in and day out. Um, the product really, it, it produces and consumes hundreds of pieces of open source. And people talked about this earlier, you know. We consume you know, a few hundred pieces of, uh, a few hundred node packages. We have lockdown package.json. We have a whole infrastructure of how we track and measure and, and do security scans and things on our open source. But we're also contributing to open source projects. We keep that whole flow going. We try to have our complete roadmap and our iteration plans and our end games all very transparent. They all exist in GitHub as issues. They come out in, iteration, in uh, draft form. We'll actually do a roadmap or an iteration. We publish it as a draft. We let people comment on it. We provide feedback back and forth. And then we make it official and we publish it. Um, everyone on the team, so it doesn't matter if you're a program manager. Or we actually don't have testers. We're all testers, uh, designers, um, engineers. We all do everything together. So everybody's a developer. Everybody at the end of the month is a tester. In fact, last week and this week are our end game as we prepare for the next monthly release. Um, we all interact with customers day in and day out. Uh, so it brings everyone together as sort of a, a single cohesive team. Um, we try to ship as a service would ship, right? We ship actually daily. There's two builds of VS Code that you can get. There's one we call the insiders build. And it's the exact same build that we use to develop the tool. It ships every single night, sometimes more often than every single night, because we've implemented systems that let us basically click a checkbox and say, release this to the world. And what's great about it is you get features like literally the next day when they come out. Um, bug fix is the same thing. And for us, it means that we get sort of the, uh, the canary in the coal mine. We, so like any big issues, we get reported on very, very quickly. And so I always encourage everybody to use the Insiders build because it helps us and it helps you. Uh, so check it out when you get, when you get back or on your laptops. Um, and then we, we ship stable and monthly. Um, but one of the things we try to do there is we interact with the community is we try to say thank you. And this has been a, you know, an interesting thing. And we actually wrote tools so that we can easily look at all the pull requests that come in over the month, because there's usually 30 or 40. And we generate thank you notes for people. And people love this. They really like to see their notes or their, their work recognized. And they use it sort of like, you know, there's a lot of people that say, hey, you know, I've got uh, GitHub check-ins every day. But, and it builds up the resume. Checking in or getting your pull requests also get um, you know, sort of your resume expanded. So it's a lot of fun to, uh, to do this. But it really, we moved from doing closed source 
development where we shipped products once every 18 months to being open source shipping daily, which is a big transformation for us. But not only do we do the development in the open, what we try to do is what we, what we call zero distance between our engineers, the whole team actually, and customers. So we have this awesome code, uh, awesome handle on Twitter, it's at code, and didn't cost us anything. It's a good story, I'll tell you about it later. Um, <clears throat> so we've got 132,000 followers there, but everybody is out in Stack Overflow and Gitter. Um, we actually, you know, when we have interesting things that come up on Hacker News, we get involved right there. Uh, what's interesting, Satya actually is quite a big fan of reading Hacker News. And whenever we show up, we get a piece of email, which is pretty fun. Um, we are distributed globally, so we have half the team in Zurich, Switzerland. We have half the team in Redmond. We got one guy in Scotland, but we leverage those time zones so that we can take it. We can be present 24 hours a day, which is cool. I already talked about GitHub. And one thing that's interesting, <coughs> we do get about 70 to 100 issues a day that come in, and we watch, we, we look at and we review every single one of those issues, and we farm them out that day as soon as they come in. We basically dedicate one person every week to be what we call our inbox tracker. Um, this is, you know, it's a team that's got 25 people. And uh, if you look at Visual Studio, they get about 100 and 110 issues a day, and there's hundreds of people in Visual Studio. But we manage to do it with a small number of people because this is one of the things that we focus on. We think it's very important to have this direct engagement with customers. But probably the most interesting thing is the last thing on here is we learned very hard, uh, or very much the hard way, is how to be humble and how to listen. And when we do things wrong, we have to say, yep, we were wrong. Um, anybody familiar with the icon color of Visual Studio Code? <coughs> Yeah, good times. That was a lot of fun. Uh, that was one we really went on and on and on, and we had to figure out what the right thing to do was. And at the end of the day, we reverted. We listened to what people said. We pushed some things out in uh, an extension, like, and people didn't like it. We turned around the next day. We kind of rectified it. Um, a lot of our design discussions actually happen in GitHub issues. Almost all of our design discussions actually happen there. And we get lots of feedback, and we can iterate on it in real time. Um, but that's a, like, some of the, one of the ways we really create a deep connection with customers. Sort of the last one that I want to talk about, though, is this whole notion of not having any broken windows. So sometimes we'll see that somebody will be unhappy with VS Code. <coughs> and what we don't want is that to sort of create this whole pattern where people get negative, negative, negative. So we saw this blog post, and I won't be switching to VS Code anytime soon, which really hurt us. Um, so we reached out to him. We said, hey, what can we do to help you? Other people in the, in the community reached out. What can we do? Like, like, what are the problems? We can go and fix them. Oh, you're missing X, Y, and Z. This is how you do it. And <coughs> as a result of doing that, about a week later, this guy writes another blog post. <laughs> I must begrudgingly admit, VS Code is a better editor. But if you do these things, and they don't really cost a lot, but you actually have to say, this is the thing that we're going to go and do. It's a part of our daily engineering uh, cadence. And it actually pays huge dividends at the end of the day. Because what you have is a community powering the growth of the tool. So what happens is when you see great results of the state of JavaScript survey usually takes like five iterations or, or five impressions for people to start and go and, and look at something. What we see is a huge influx of people going to try out VS Code as a result of the surveys. We have this guy over here <coughs> on the right hand side, Wes Boss. Who uses Sublime in here? All right, it's okay to say it, it's fine. It's very it's fast, it's wonderful. Uh, so Wes Boss is the guy that wrote the book on Sublime. Like there's a book about Sublime, and he wrote the book. And one day, he was redoing his machine or something, and he tweeted, hey, what's the new configurations everybody's using for Sublime? And then somebody said, you should try VS Code and try that. And he said, I'll give it a try. And then about a week later, Wes Boss is you know, a huge influencer and user now of VS Code, but he's got this massive Twitter following. So he goes out and tweets about it, and it helps us. We did some work. Uh, we did a blog post, talked to Smashing Magazine. They have a great approach, but they have a million followers on Twitter. You can't buy advertisement like that. So when people, you know, you engage with them one on one, and the multiplier is just huge. So again, it's part of what the community, or what our workflow is to to enable this transformation. And at the end of the day, what's in it for for us? If you want to look at it from a selfish perspective, um, us working in the open source community, working like this, being very transparent, and this is the ultimate goal of what we started to do was to help transform the way that people think about Microsoft. Because a few years ago. It's a big box product, Microsoft, C Sharp, blah, 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 blah. I don't want to talk to them. Um, and we weren't really relevant. And so now what we're seeing is because of this, people are actually coming back and they're saying, hey, you know what? I really like VS Code. Let me go look what else is there. And then that's a good thing for us. Um, but our ultimate goal really is to go, or our ultimate job is to go and build this great tool and interact with the community. 
and if we, uh, at the end of the day, change the perception of Microsoft people, and then they some car uh, come and start to use our, our additional tools and services, and that's good for us. But at the end of the day, we're going to be a, a great tool. So that's kind of the transformation that, that we went through uh, as a product team, and really it was all built on Node. Runs in Electron, uh, JavaScript, like I said, we consume hundreds of pieces of open source, um, and it makes us very agile. We're all very happy. Everybody loves it. <laughs> And yeah, so that happy code and go download it if you haven't downloaded it. Thank you.